Good evening, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So we've had an incredible amount of different changes in regards to um, China and Canada in the last uh, couple of days, and I thought we would do a show checking in with Charles Burton, who is an expert on China, um, about uh, the departure of the two Michaels from China and their arrival back in Canada, the uh, deferred prosecution agreement between uh, the former or the actual CFO of uh, Huawei and uh, the U.S. government, and therefore her departure from Canada and her arrival back in, in China, and frankly, more importantly, what this all means to Canada-China's relations. Uh, Charles Burton uh, has been on our show before. He's uh, unbelievably knowledgeable about what's going on in China. He is currently the non-resident senior fellow for the European Center Value Center for Security Policy. He uh, has been a senior fellow to the McDonald Laurier Institute and the partner of Charles Burton and Associates. For 31 years, he was an associate professor at Brock University. Uh, and uh, for a couple of years back in the 1990s and early 2000s, he worked in the Canadian Embassy uh, in China as a counselor of political and economic affairs. He's got a postdoctoral fellow from the University of Alberta. He was educated at Fudan University, University of Toronto, University of uh, Cambridge. This man has got a lot of academic background and a lot of practical uh, background in what's going on in China. Uh, Charles, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, tell us, what did you think? It was almost like, you know, bang, 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 a whole bunch of different things happened this weekend. Well, I was certainly uh, delighted to see that Michael Kovrick and Michael Saver are now uh, out of Chinese prison hell after over a thousand days and safely back with their families in Canada. And I pray that they'll have a successful transition from, uh, you know, what must be a very emotionally uh, difficult experience, the sensory deprivation in the prison, the constant interrogation, and the not knowing, you know, what's going on. So that was a, a, a very positive development. Uh, the deferred prosecution agreement with regard to uh, the Huawei CFO, Meng Wanzhou, um, I was uh, not entirely uh, surprised that she decided to accept that because the um, decision by Justice uh, Holmes of the BC Superior Court with regard to whether the US extradition request to have Ms. Meng removed to um, face a judicial process in the uh, Eastern District of, uh, of New York courts um, was coming to a, a conclusion. And it seemed most likely that uh, the extradition request would be considered valid. But that being said, I think as more information came out about the uh, U.S. charges against Ms. Meng, it became more and more apparent that the case might be uh, weak and, you know, that she, uh, she might be successful in uh, defending against those charges in New York. So the U.S. authorities have come up with a deal whereby she acknowledges wrongdoing in misleading the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank with regard to a Huawei subsidiary that was doing business in Iran, thereby exposing the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank to um, violating the uh, U.S. sanctions against uh, banking business uh, through the U.S. system with Iran, um, which does allow for um, the U.S. to use this confession of sorts to further strengthen its case against uh, the Huawei company. So Ms. Meng gets to go back to China, but the U.S. does have something that they can use to um, uh, continue to, to show that Huawei has uh, engaged in practices which are not consistent with U.S. law. I think that um, once Ms. Meng was flying back to China, uh, we did not expect that the Chinese government would release Mr. Kovrick and Mr. Spavor so soon. Uh, we certainly expected to see a negotiated release. You know, there was the um, possibility that China might insist that Canada, for example, accept the uh, Huawei 5G technology into our telecommunication system uh, decision that our government has not yet made, or some other, you know, some other negotiating tactic to further Chinese interests in, in Canada, but they didn't do that. They released Kovrigan's favor immediately. And I think what this was trying to do was to establish a moral equivalence 
between the detaining of Miss Mung in you know her two uh, multi-million dollar mansions in British Columbia and the uh, hostage taking of two innocent connect, uh, Canadians, Michael Kovrick and Michael Saver, and subjecting them to over a thousand days of hell for uh, no reason except to try and pressure the Canadian government to uh, release Miss Mung back to China. So I think from that point of view, um, you know, China was sending out a signal. And the signal is that they regard what happened to Miss Mung as, you know, as illegitimate as what they did to Kovrick and Saver. And secondly, that China would no longer pretend that Kovrick and Spavor actually were picked up on valid um, espionage grounds, you know, by, by making such a direct connection between um, Ms. Meng's return to China and um, the release of Kovrick and Spavor, they're sending out a highly unambiguous signal that this is something that the Chinese government will do, that they're prepared to violate these diplomatic norms and engage in hostage diplomacy if it suits China's interests and they feel that it's necessary because China feels that, you know, Canada or another country has um, abused uh, process with regard to their national. So it's a, it's a disturbing situation, um, you know, but that being said, we're all very happy to see Kovrick and Staver back and happy to see the uh, Hmong matter uh, out of Canada's hands. So, you know, I have a very mixed feeling about it, but on the whole, I think it does not bode well for the, for the future of the relationship and China's role in the world. I can't imagine what a thousand days in, uh, in Chinese prison would, would be like, like unbelievable. Anyway, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Charles Burton, uh, expert on China, uh, discussing what happened with the two Michaels, discussing what happened with the CFO of Huawei um, and what it all means uh, in a minute. Just uh, stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour, Saga 960. So on the weekend, uh, Charles uh, Burton, expert on China, you were saying that uh, you were surprised at how quickly the Chinese government released the two Michaels after uh, the return of uh, the Huawei CFO. Um, they're actually saying now that it was for health reasons that they released the two Michaels. Um, is this just for public consumption or to try to cover their tracks or what? Well, the, you know, I think there's a bit of obfuscation here because clearly, you know, this is really about a prison, trying to depict it as a prisoner swap. You know, they, the Chinese media does not acknowledge that Ms. Meng, um, uh, you know, made a statement of admitting wrongdoing. They suggest that it's a great uh, victory for the Chinese people, that it's due to the unflagging persistence of the Chinese Communist Party and the government. And uh, essentially, you know, the way it's depicted was that China had pressured the Canadians to release Ms. Meng, um, something that could have been done a long time ago. So they don't acknowledge the actual facts of the matter. I think, um, you know, in terms of the uh, of the release of, of Kovrick and, and Saver, the idea that, you know, that, that the Chinese government had obtained a confession from both Mr. Kovrick and Mr. Saver, and then out of benevolent grounds, released them um, for medical treatment in Canada, uh, you know, is highly doubtful. I, I think we will probably hear from Kovrick and Saver if in fact they did make a confession. But I would say that any confession that might have been made by Mr. Kovrick or by Mr. Saver was a confession obtained under duress and therefore really wouldn't have any standing. They, so finally, the Chinese government says that they were released on bail with assurances given by Dominic Barton, the Canadian ambassador. So I think that what that means is that the Chinese government does not want Kovrick and Saver to discuss what happened to them, you know, what they were asked in the um, relentless thousand days of interrogation or to provide details about the uh, treatment that they received while in prison. I mean, Mr. Kovrick has obviously lost a great deal of weight. And when Kevin Garrett uh, described his um, treatment in his book, uh, Two Tears on the Window, he said that they only received meals about 70% of the time. So, you know, it's possible that uh, 
that they, they would say things that would not reflect favorably on the Chinese prison system. But I, I, now that they're in Canada, I don't think there's any means for the Chinese government to enforce that. I do know that when Garrett was returned, he was shadowed by Chinese security for some time in Canada. But I imagine with Kovrigan's favor that our RCMP will ensure that they are protected from any, um, you know, Chinese harassment activities, such as Garrett believes that he uh, obtained to try and get him not to talk about, you know, his experience. Eventually he did. So I, I don't buy the idea that they were released because both of them fell sick simultaneously and had to be put on the same plane. I, I think it's really uh, uh, just a, a, a sort of a, a cover right. to try and maintain this fiction that the Chinese ambassador and the Chinese um, foreign ministry spokesman have been saying over and over again that there's no connection between the Hmong case and the Kovrick and Spavor cases. But, uh, you know, the fact that they released them so soon after Miss Hmong returned um, suggests that they're trying to play both sides of the street on that one. This and we all know described. that it's connected, you know. This has been described as hostage diplomacy. Is it hostage diplomacy? Uh, well, yes, I think that the Chinese government felt wrongly that, um, you know, that the independence of the Canadian judiciary is not real. And that if they exerted pressure on the government of Canada, that, that the prime minister or the prime minister's office would direct Justice Holmes on how to rule, or that the Canadian minister of justice would intervene in the process and, uh, and uh, stop the extradition hearing, which, you know, is theoretically possible under the extradition uh, treaty if it's seen as being um, in Canada's interest not to extradite someone. The Minister of Justice does have that discretion. But I think that due to the um, popular, you know, Canadian public's uh, focus on this question, that that option was not really available. But you know, the Prime Minister stated that we would not be uh, releasing Ms. Meng under pressure. And I don't think the Chinese government uh, appreciated the extent to which the Canadian public would be outraged by the arbitrary uh, detention of Kovrick and Spavor. You know, one of Canada's national newspapers, the Globe and Mail, had the number of days that these two men were held on the front page day after day after Every day. day. And certainly, you know, we've discussed it quite a bit. And and any uh, Canadians who are aware of it are very, very disturbed about what the Chinese government did to our to our fellow citizens. And I think for people like me who, uh, you know, frequently travel to China, it means that we no longer have the confidence that our security can be assured if we go there. So, you know, a lot of people just won't be returning to China until uh, the, the political situation there changes. Well, that's an issue I certainly want to come back to, but uh, let's... Uh because that's probably of greatest concern to the vast majority of people. But let's go through some of these issues a little bit uh, in greater detail. So this, um, you know, this belief the Chinese had that there was uh, a political opportunity to overrule the judici judiciary. Do you think that, that there was and that the Canadian government didn't take advantage of it because of blow black, blowback from SNC-Lavalin? Uh, yes, I think that that sort of thing does uh, matter. I think that... Um... You know, really, um, people of Ms. Meng's uh, high cadre rank in China do not travel abroad freely. They all have to go through processes of permission. And, you know, we know that, bizarrely enough, when Ms. Meng was uh, detained at the Vancouver airport, they found that she had seven passports in her purse. So, you know, this is not a normal traveler. Um, one would have thought that when the Chinese government became aware that Latin in August 2018, the US had put out a warrant for her arrest, that they could have readily gone through all a list of countries that have extradition treaties with the US and not let Ms. Meng go to any of them out of fear that she could be a subject to detainment. So there seemed to be such confidence in the Chinese regime that Canada would not respond to a US request for a senior member of the Chinese regime. And then when Canada did that, I think China panicked and decided to pick up those two Canadians to send a message to the prime minister to, to focus his attention and get Ms. Meng uh, released from, well, she was in prison in the initial phase. Uh, but, um, you know, our, our prime minister decided not to do that. And I think uh, subsequently, 
after the uh, detaining of um, of Kovrigan's favor, the Canadian public would not have uh, accepted uh, an unconditional release of Ms. Meng, and all our negotiations with the Chinese regime got us nowhere with regard to them uh, admitting that holding Kovrigan's favor was extremely damaging to their interests in Canada, as as it is, and I think will be in the years ahead. This deferred prosecution agreement, um, so you've commented about how uh, the CFO of Huawei admitted wrongdoing, but from what I understand, she has no obligation uh, to cooperate, uh, to, uh, to return to the United States uh, and in any way, shape or form provide testimony against Huawei, which um, in those kinds of settlements is, is often one of the requirements. And so is that a get out of jail free card for her? It seems to be that way, and it's a, it's surprising that the agreement uh, has been so favorable to to Ms. Ma. You know, it may be that the uh, U.S. government really felt that they had to do something to to help out Canada, because um, you know it, it, we we've been quite unhappy with the U.S. Uh, in general in in our relations, and and I think that we felt that the U.S should have done more for Kovrigan's favor, which they didn't. The other curious thing is that, you know, according to U.S. sources, the U.S. did not make the release of Kovrigan's favor uh, conditional in a side agreement with the U.S. Uh, when they negotiated the deferred prosecution agreement. And that, um, you know, peremptory uh, release of Kovrigan's favor was informed to the Canadian authorities through the uh, Canadian ambassador to the United States. So it doesn't seem to have been really in a response to anything the Canadian government did. It might be in response to generalized Canadian public opinion on China. Um, you know, the, the possibility that, that uh, Canadian public opinion would demand that our government um, not participate in the upcoming Olympics or or in other ways sanction Chinese officials for complicity in the Uyghur genocide. But in general, my own feeling is that while the Canadian government stated that the release of Kovrigan's favor was Canada's number one foreign policy priority, I don't think it was even our number one foreign policy priority with regard to China. I think what our government's main priority was the maintenance of trade and investment uh, agreements uh, between Canadian corporations and China, because those Canadian corporations have a lot of influence in uh, the, the halls of power in Ottawa, as they should, because they do, uh, you know, major corporations do promote prosperity in our country. But, you know, I think a lot of what the government was saying was simply to appease Canadian public opinion, but wasn't actually indicative of any particular retaliation to China or meaningful negotiation with regard to the release of Kovrigan's favor. I, I feel disappointed our government didn't do more. But, you know, that being said, they're out. It's, uh, there's no point dwelling on the past, but I think we have to start looking towards the future of Canada-China relations and how we proceed now. Yeah, I, I agree, but let's hold off on that just for a couple more minutes. Um, uh, you talked about the lack of Canadian effort. The, the story is that Dominic Barton, the Canadian ambassador uh, to China, spent a couple of months in the United States negotiating this deferred prosecution agreement. So, you know, th th that's got to be incredibly unusual for a Canadian ambassador to China to travel to a third party country, the United States, to negotiate a deferred prosecution agreement, isn't it? Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. You know, at critical at a critical time in the Canada-China relationship, we were without an ambassador, and so you know when we didn't get any access to um, the trials, I think one could attribute the fact that we only had a, a junior official as charge d'affaires, while Mr. Barton was going around to all and sundry in Washington trying to get them to uh, release Meng Wanzhou. So you know, this is more or less without precedent, Mr. Barton does not have uh, diplomatic accreditation to the United States. We have a highly competent ambassador and embassy there. So, you know, what this was all about is completely puzzling to me. And I, I, I hope that, uh, you know, maybe later on we'll get more explanation of why the government allowed Mr. Barton to leave his post in China and engage in some form of lobbying in the United States which appeared to be lobbying 
on behalf of the government of China more than on the behalf of the government of Canada because the idea was release Meng Wanzhou and put a side deal that we can get Kovrick and Spaber out. I'm, I'm, I'm very puzzled and disturbed by, by that whole incident. But, um, you know, we haven't got any real explanation of what was going on beyond the fact that Barton was in Washington for quite a long time. I wonder if you could uh, put any light on this deferred prosecution agreement, because it's a little bit ironic that 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 term uh, became so noteworthy in Canada a couple of years ago because of the SNC-Lavalin issue, mm -hmm. where my understanding of what it was, it was a situation where the Attorney General of Canada could effectively override the judgment of the prosecutors uh, if she felt it was in Canada's interest. Um, why was a deferred prosecution agreement used in the United States? And was it that, that, that similarly, there was a political override of, of what the prosecutors were interested in doing? I, I don't have, you know, we don't have any information about whether there was uh, political interference with the U.S. Department of Justice in this matter, or if they had determined that their case was against Ms. Mung was not as airtight as they had thought and therefore decided to cut their losses and get her to make the statement that they could use in other uh, proceedings against Huawei. But yeah, I am troubled by it. I mean, for one thing, it looked as if Ms. Mung would be extradited to the U.S. And once in the U.S., uh, she might have been um, prevailed upon to cut a plea bargain and provide us with more information about any relationship that her company Huawei has with uh, uh, Ch Chinese uh, security and intelligence agencies. So, um, you know, I really thought that despite the Canadian pressure uh, to to get this uh, deferred prosecution agreement, I'd really thought that the U.S. would uh, would not cave into that and would and would prefer to have Ms. Meng uh, in the United States because that would serve their political interests uh, better. Um, but uh, it. You know, the agreement's a bit of a puzzle because, as you say, it seems to be a very weak agreement. Um, and Ms. Mung basically gets off scot-free. And the question is, why did we wait three years to do this instead of uh, in a more timely fashion to save the suffering of Kovrick and Spaber? Why do you think? I think it's because our, our government uh, is, uh, you know, wasn't really concerned about what some Canadian officials have privately uh, dismissed as two consular cases, but we're thinking more in terms of, you know, larger issues of trade and investment and the geopolitical and geostrategic rise of China and not wanting to, um, to uh, uh, put a break in Canada-China relations by Canada allying itself with the U.S. and Australia and the U.K. in the aus Yucas or allying ourselves with the um, uh, U.S., uh, Japan, India, and Australia in uh, what's referred to as the Quad. Both of these U.S. alliances uh, primarily being designed to try and come to terms with China's violations of the international rules-based order, and both of which have excluded Canada even though Canada is geographically closer to the Asia Pacific than uh, Australia. And of course, we're a larger uh, country with a greater population. So, you know, why didn't we insist on being part of, of both of those alliances in the Canadian interest? And I think, I think it's because our government is uh, still uh, feeling that, um, you know, the future lies with China and we should engage. So, uh, you know, right now, we, I think our government faces a policy choice. There seem to be two factions. Um, one is, okay, the Michaels are back. Um, you know, there's no need for us to use the, the fact of the hostage diplomacy to constrain us from making a decision on Huawei 5G or cracking down on Chinese cyber espionage in Canada or cracking down on Chinese uh, influence of uh, policymakers or harassment of people in Canada. You know, it's time for us to get into compliance with a more Australian approach to relations with China. That's one stance. The other is, which I think is the one that our government appears to be tending towards, judging by statements from Minister Garneau and various people associated with advising the government on China, is, okay, it's over. Um, Mung matters been settled. The two Michaels are back. We should get back into re-engaging with China 
um, cooperating in trade, uh, competing where we need to compete, um, you know, uh, and confronting uh, at least lip service uh, against China's violations of the norms of diplomacy, human rights, trade, and uh, and security. Um, so, you know, I think that maybe a, there's a strong element within the Canadian political establishment currently in power who wants to go back to before December 2018, see if we can do um, a free trade agreement with China, uh, possibly accept the Huawei 5G into our telecommunications, maybe by finessing it by saying, well, we'll let them uh, have 5G in the periphery of our telecommunication system, but not in the core. Although from experts I've heard, you know, there's not, it's hard to distinguish between periphery and core, but essentially give the Chinese government what's it, what it wants in the hope that Canada will get favored in terms of uh, economic and trade with China and will not be subject to as much non-tariff barriers as as China is currently imposing on us as punishment for, you know, the the uh, detainment of the Huawei CFO. So I, I'm, I'm feeling a bit despairing about the future, but I hope that I'm wrong about this and that we will see uh, the government adopting policies more consistent with what Canadians want, which is for us to show some backbone and to, and to get together with our like-minded allies to come up with a joint approach to try and bring China into greater compliance with the norms of trade and diplomacy to the benefit of all. But uh, it's not looking like the government will do that. And of course, the Liberals did win the election and the Conservatives had quite a strong China policy in their platform. And that's pretty much gone to dust, I think. I think it has. And uh, maybe I'd like to raise that um, when we come back uh, from a message, because I've heard some interesting comments about that. So uh, we're chatting with Charles Burton, uh, senior fellow with the McDonald Laurie Institute uh, about China uh, and uh, the two Michaels and about the CFO of Huawei and what's going on with the deferred prosecution agreement. And more importantly, what it means to Canada, China's relations uh, going forward. Stay with us. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Wire on Saga 960. We're talking with uh, Charles Burton uh, today. He spent 30 years as a professor at uh, Brock University uh, talking about uh, China issues and I guess other stuff as well. Uh, and uh, he's a senior fellow with McDonald Laurier Institute. And you're also a senior fellow with uh, uh, the non-resident fellow of some uh, other organization. What's this other organization, uh, Charles? Uh, the uh, European Value Center for Security Policy is based in Prague. And, um, you know, from the... From there, I've been advising European governments on how to meet the challenge of China. And a lot of those governments have um, you know, extensive expertise in countering uh, the Russian threat, but they find themselves falling short as China is becoming a bigger and bigger issue for them. So people like me um, you know, have to fill in the gap until they're able to get that expertise in-house. So it's been a, a wonderful opportunity for me to spend a lot of time in Europe and uh, Love Prague. You know, you point Prague your camera in any city. direction. What? No question. Yeah, any direction you point your camera, you get a picture postcard. It's just beautiful. And uh, the people there have been very good to me. So I, I'm very happy to continue my association there. And, uh, you know, uh, gives me a chance to travel to many uh, European capitals and stay in elegant uh, 19th century hotels and, um, and deal with governments that seem to have a better take on China, uh, you know, the risk of China to their sovereignty and security than uh, we see here in Canada. So I guess well, I'm more of a profit abroad than here. Let's talk <laughs> about that a little bit. Uh, so you mentioned the election. Uh, the Conservative Party did have a far harder line in their mm -hmm. uh, in their platform, their policies, uh, and and you know some of the statements that Aaron O'Toole, the uh, the leader of the Conservative Party, made in regards to China. Um, and I am hearing, I don't know what you've heard, you've probably got far better intelligence than I, but I've been hearing that uh, that uh, the Chinese-Canadian turnout in the election was down because there were pamphlets that were handed out in numerous different places uh, with uh, strong Chinese-Canadian uh, uh, populations, discouraging people from voting uh, for uh, the Conservatives that that would be damaging to do, uh, to, to Canada Chinese relations, and it scared people a little bit. Um, have you heard any of that? And do you think that that that, that uh, pamphlet scare tactics uh, played a role in the election? 
Yeah, it's very hard to say. I mean, we did see some prominent um, uh, Chinese Canadians like uh, Alice Wong and uh, and particularly Kenny Zhou um, in Richmond uh, lose their seats. Um, you, you know, in the case of Mr. Zhou in uh, Richmond, uh, there was once the it, it looked like the Conservatives might achieve a m minority government in Canada, um, disinformation started to appear on Chinese websites with regard to Mr. Zhao's um, private member bill on uh, foreign influence. Um, you know, basically, Mr. Zhao had a bill that would require that people who uh, were in positions of influence in Canada in the policy process would have to declare if they're recipients of benefits from a foreign power. You know, which seems to me like a perfectly reasonable thing. So in other words, if you're being paid by, say, China uh, in some sort of direct or indirect way, and you're also lobbying in ways which serve Chinese national interests, that we should know that, you know, that you've received benefits from a foreign state. It doesn't seem to me to be uh, uh, anything but a no-brainer. But the, uh, the disinformation in the Chinese language on WeChat and many websites suggested that all Chinese Canadians would have to register with the state and would be subject to various constraints. So uh, Mr. Zhao, um, you know, explained the truth um, in, the, in the English media in Vancouver and appeared on a YouTube interview where in Mandarin he explained um, that this disinformation was wrong. Um, and then there was further disinformation that suggested the Conservatives came to power that WeChat, the most popular social media for communicating with China that's probably used by over a million Canadians several times a day, including myself, to contact uh, friends and family in China, would be banned under the Conservatives. So this was some, um, you know, very serious disinformation that that was difficult to refute because we couldn't figure out where it was coming from. You know, the authorship was not properly attributed. Um, and the uh, the websites that, that uh, you know, grew sprinkled out like mushrooms in Canada in the Chinese language were also not attributable to any known association. I think the concern is whether the template for this disinformation, um, you know, was drafted in Beijing. If that's the case, then, you know, this is a serious uh, problem of foreign interference in the Canadian democratic process. It's very hard to say, um, you know, certainly whether that was tipped the balance and caused these uh, members of parliament to lose their seats or, or not, you know, we can't really tell. But certainly, um, I think that it's something that the Canadian government has to look into to ensure that there isn't um, a problem of increasing foreign disinformation that misinforms people about a party's political platform. In other words, it's perfectly valid for people not to vote for people like Kenny Zhao, or Alice Wong, if they, you know, if they uh, feel that their policy is unfriendly to the People's Republic of China, you know, in, in Canada or a democratic country. And if you favor the Chinese Communist Party, um, you know, that's, uh, that's well within your rights. But what we wouldn't, what we want is for people to make their decision on voting based on the truth, not based on, uh, on you know, facts uh, like falsehoods, which mischaracterize um, uh, the relevant uh, political platform. So I, I don't know what so far um, we haven't seen Elections Canada very interested in this. Um, they've said that, you know, it's within the rights of any foreigners to make any statements they wish about uh, Canadian election results. So the fact that the Chinese ambassador issued statements pretty clearly um, menacing the conservative um, platform, if conservative platform was brought in, there would be consequences, we were told. Um, but uh, the disinformation, I think, is a different thing. And Elections Canada seems to be deferring that over to security agencies and so far, I haven't heard any kind of response. The question really is, can we head off the disinformation before it happens? Because in the case of Mr. Zhao, he was never able to reach the audience for that disinformation to, to inform them that, you know, that this just was dead wrong. So it, it, is, a, it is a big concern, um, you know, and I think it is one that we should be taking much more seriously because 
you know, Canadian democracy is a precious thing, and we we ought to maintain the integrity of it. So four years ago, uh, in the United States, the Democratic Party was all over, um, you know, the idea of Russian uh, inappropriate Russian influence in the uh, in the U.S. election. Um, do you think we should have that kind of investigation? That's that, that kind of controversy, that kind of uh, of you know the equivalent of a congressional kind of investigation in Canada of Chinese influence in the in the last federal election. Well, I think it's certainly something that the Common Special Committee on Canada-China Relations, which presumably will be revived because the Liberals uh, are in a minority when they they oppose this committee. Um, they've opposed its reconstitution and the original establishment of it, but the other parties are supportive of it. And I think that, um, you know, if it's possible to establish a link between this disinformation and a foreign government, that, you know, that would be something that would have to be uh, addressed. But, you know, it's very difficult uh, to do this kind of work. And I, uh, I hope that we have people who have the expertise who can look at those websites and, and track uh, where the origin was and and give us the information so that we can um, respond appropriately. You know, if it came out of the Chinese embassy, for example, uh, one would expect that the diplomats involved would be declared persona non grata, and we'd make it clear that this just shouldn't happen ever again. So uh, before the break, you made... uh... You, you described two different uh, organizations uh, that uh, were uh, um, excluding Canada um, that have been organized by the United States. And then you made an interesting comment. You said that Canada is closer to China than Australia is. Well, certainly from the Asia Pacific, from BC, we, we have a, we're a slight geographic advantage in terms of as the crow flies across the Pacific. Yes. Really? That's fascinating. And, and I've been uh, told by numerous different people, if you do it, on uh, not necessarily as the crow flies, but as a plane would fly on the Great Circle w- route, uh, we're even closer uh, because of the curvature of the Earth. Um, yeah, when so- you take a flight from Toronto to uh, to Beijing, uh, you know you're in sight of land from the right side of the plane. It's not like it, you know, goes across the ocean from Vancouver that the, the world is round. It's fascinating, and of course, on that route, you get a magnificent view of the Canadian North as the plane comes down you know, over basically across the Bering Strait and then uh, through Alaska and all over uh, northern Canada. Incidentally, um, you know, the Chinese media reports on Meng Wanzhou's return to China said that her plane purposely uh, avoided passing over Alaska for fear that the U.S. would bring it down over its territory. So, you know, which strikes me as a bit ridiculous, but, you know, that's what they said. (laughs) The two organizations that you mentioned uh, that have been established by the Americans, uh, and one of them you said was what? Uh, the United States, Australia, uh, Japan, and India um, that were uh, organized to combat uh, Chinese aggression. Um, tell us a little bit more about these organizations and why Canada shouldn't want to be part of them. Well, I mean, I think the, you know, the reason that Canada doesn't want to be part of them is because the Chinese government would be very hap- unhappy if we, if we joined into these alliances, which... You know, China doesn't prefers an asymmetrical bilateral relationship with countries, and doesn't want uh, you know to for nations to establish a a critical mass that could effectively um, counter uh, Chinese uh, malign activities. So, um, but you know, in the case of the uh, Ausukas, um, it's about uh, strengthening Australia's defense capability for starters. But it's also about all sorts of exchange of information and coordination with regard to challenging China. Um, And the Quad is the same thing involving India, Japan, uh, the United States and Australia, all countries which have been uh, subject to a lot of malign activities by the PRC that, um, you know, that we we just we just don't want that. We just want to be able to come up with some means to try and incentivize the Chinese government to play by the rules of the game. Unfortunately, the U.S. has not been able to get consensus from um, Germany and France, uh, major European powers in this, or from evidently or from Canada. In fact, um, you know, it's from what we hear. The U.S. didn't even bother to invite Canada or inform us about the formation of these alliances because uh, evidently the United States and these other countries have lost confidence in um, Canada's reliability as a as a partner in this enterprise. And you know, it's not helpful that Canada 
make statements like we should invite China into the Trans-Pacific Partnership when the Trans-Pacific Partnership was established to to create a, tr an alternative uh, trade um, uh, pact uh, to to uh, be able to to engage in free and fair and reciprocal trade, which is not possible if uh, the People's Republic of China is involved, because China just doesn't respect um, the spirit and the terms of international agreements. That's pretty clear. So, so if you, you know, were advising the Canadian government today, you would be saying. Do not have a bilateral relationship. Get involved in these multilateral organizations. Is that the case? Yeah, I think that you know, I think that we do have to, for example, reduce our trade dependence on China. It's not that great, but you know, there there are some agricultural commodities like soybeans and uh, and canola seeds that that we've been doing a lot of business with China, and China is able to arbitrarily, on you know, on spurious grounds apply non-tariff barriers to these commodities by claiming, you know, their impur impurities in the shipments and so on. So, you know, because most of our, our exports to China are agricultural commodities and minerals for which there is a global market, if we, um, you know, concentrate on seeking markets elsewhere and China sources from other places, you know, we'll still be able to sell. And after China imposed quite serious trade sanctions on Australia, in response to, among other things, Australia's demand that there be an independent international inquiry into the origins of uh, COVID-19, Australia was able to diversify a lot of its commodity sales to other other countries, and the economic damage to Australia was uh, not as great as China probably had hoped. We're trying today with Charles Burton. He's an expert on China. We're talking about. Uh... The two Michaels, uh, the Huawei CFO, uh, the deferred prosecution agreement, the, their return to uh, the two Michaels return to Canada and its implications for Chinese uh, Canadian uh, relations. One of the things that uh, Charles mentioned is concerns, uh, Canadian business people and Canadian uh, people, diplomats, etc. cetera, uh, just maybe tourists would have about traveling to China. We're going to take a final break, come back with some concluding comments. I'm going to ask uh, Charles about, you know, the reality the personal reality of, uh, of Chinese Canadian relations in regards to, should we go there? Should we fly to go see the great wall of China? Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie radio hour, Saga 960. Uh, uh, Charles Burton has joined us. He's a, a senior fellow with the McDonald, uh, Laurie Institute. He's an expert on China. He spent 30 years, uh, uh, as a professor at uh, Brock University, uh, he's got uh, a philosophy uh, degree in Chinese philosophy from Fudan University. That must have been an interesting uh, experience. Uh, and uh, um, and you spent time in the in the in the embassy in China. Tell us about that. That must have been a fascinating experience. Well, yes. I mean, I was educated in China. Um, I spent four years at Fudan University studying the history of ancient Chinese thought uh, before China open to the West. So, you know, all our food was rationed and everything. It was a, a, a wonderful experience for a young person to get that uh, immersion into uh, Chinese life and live in close contact with uh, Chinese students in, in the residence. Of course, there were only 13 foreign students at uh, Fudan University in Shanghai in those years. Um, there are now thousands of them, I think. And then um, subsequently, uh, because Canada needed people with my kind of expertise, I was uh, seconded from Brock University to work in the Canadian Embassy in Beijing on two diplomatic postings. And that was also a, a wonderful experience for me to, to get involved in the nuts and bolts of trying to uh, make the relationship work. Um, you know, there's a lot of optimism when I was a student in China with the Cultural Revolution ending and seemed to be a lot of wonderful uh, hope for China's future and getting into, um, you know, re-entering into the global community and global norms. And again, when I was in the embassy, we also had confidence that uh, as China marketized its economy and got closer to interaction with the West, that we would see a democratization of China's political system. Unfortunately, um, you know, since Xi Jinping came into power, eight years ago, uh, you know, that that, that dream is, has vanished. But, um, it, you know, I, I don't regret my association with China. I, I do regret that uh, 
relations have got so bad that people like me really can't safely travel back to China. For one thing, um, you know, we understand that Mr. Kovrig, who was a former diplomat in China, was interrogated on matters uh, relating to secrets that he uh, came privy to while he was a diplomat, and that's a gross violation of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 1962. And I would have a similar sort of um, uh, situation because I have had uh, top secret security clearance uh, relatively recently. So I think it's unwise to you know, to subject yourself to that possibility. But I'd love to uh, go back and see my friends and, uh, you know, enjoy the wonderful and rich cultural life of China. And I hope that will be possible before it's, it's, too long. It's a, it's a beautiful country. And as you know, because we've chatted about this before, I, not like you for four years, uh, just after the Cultural Revolution, but I spent six weeks in Fudan University myself and had a wonderful time. And I've traveled uh, um, extensively around China um, and loved it. It was a beautiful country. Uh, but given what's happened to the two Michaels um, and uh, given the, dis the, the, the situation between Canada and China and political relations uh, right now, if you were a Canadian businessman, would you travel to China today? Uh, no, I, I don't think I would. I mean, of course, it's not an option at present because China has such strict travel restrictions due to the uh, COVID-19. But when those are eventually lifted, um, you know, unless we have some pretty strong assurance that this won't happen that there won't be a random um, de detaining of people or that business people who, you know, aren't able to successfully um, negotiate contracts uh, find themselves in Chinese prison on spurious charges to pressure them to, say, transfer technologies to China or give up their, um, their Canadian proprietary manufacturing processes there, that uh, it's probably unwise to go. And I think that we will see a dramatic drop off of tourism to China, which, you know, is unfortunate, or for that matter, a students going to China, because we really need a lot more interaction uh, with China as China rises economically. And we need a lot more Canadians who have knowledge of the language and culture and society of China to serve in critical government positions, including security agencies, the RCMP, and uh, foreign affairs. And right now, um, you know, young Canadians don't seem to be interested in learning Mandarin or going to China because, uh, you know, the reputation of China among young people is, uh, is so bad. So it, it really is a problem. You know, we really need to get the Canadian government to put priority into giving young people the opportunity to to learn more about China so that we can be more effective in our engagement with that rising country. Why is the conservative and liberal policy towards China so different? I, I think that, um, you know, certainly uh, Aaron O'Toole in his leadership campaign put a lot of stress on his concerns over China and that, uh, you know, was transmitted into the conservative um, political program, but it wasn't really discussed in the course of the election. And, you know, as we pointed out, there have been a number of conservative seats lost, which can be attributed to the conservatives' uh, strong line on China. And I think within the conservative party, there are a lot of people who have connections with Chinese business who would prefer that the conservative not take a strong stand against China. But I think in terms of the other parties, um, you know, they clearly are not responding to the popular will, but they do seem to be responding to um, some corporate interests who are beholden to the People's Republic of China. And therefore, Canada, I think, is getting more and more uh, caught up in, a, in, in Chinese influence, which, you know, is not in the overall bent to the overall benefit of Canada or Canada's place in the world. You know, as a middle power, we want to maintain the equality of relations between states and the guarantee of reciprocal and fair sovereign relations between nations, which are encapsulated in the charters of the United Nations and the WTO and other organizations. China wants to establish what's called the community of the common destiny of mankind, where China is, you know, a dominant power and the rest of us are subordinate. And the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a major restructuring of the entire global commodity uh, economy to put China at the center, to which Canada would again be serving 
you know, the, the rise of China through providing uh, China access to our natural resources um, and energy. So, you know, this is not a direction that a sovereign country like Canada wants to take. We want, we want to have, um, you know, justice, human rights, um, uh, respect for sovereignty. That's where can Canada's interest lies, not in becoming a, a subservient um, junior partner of, uh, of an authoritarian one-party regime that uh, does not respect the rule of law. So you think that the current Canadian government policy is to be effectively a subservient junior partner to an authoritarian regime rather than support human rights, democracy, fair trade, with the rest of the Western world? Yes, I think that that's pretty much it. I mean, we really have not been prepared to stand up for the values that, you know, make the world a, a peaceful and just place as Australia has, but it's not just Canada. I mean, there's similar issues in Germany and France where there's also considerable elite capture by the Chinese regime and, uh, you know, so the U.S. is having a lot of difficulty in coordinating um, the globe to recognize what's going on and to, and to engage in, in programming that will be a benefit to us and to China. You what? know, if China was based on rule of law, free and fair trade, um, you know, democracy, respect for citizenship, that would be a wonderful thing for the Chinese people. I'm sorry, sir. What do you mean by elite capture? Well, I think this is where you see so many um, uh, people who have been in authority uh, in, with respect to China policy after retirement, uh, finding themselves beneficiaries of various uh, China associated board memberships or law firms or, or other associations that um, give them meaning and income in retirement. And I think that um, you know, what we need is more transparency about this but the Chinese uh, and, government is effectively bribing people, bribing elites with money. Cultivating and them, yeah, over a long period of time. The conservatives have, you know, had a policy that um, that uh, former, pol um, you know, civil servants and politicians would not be able to lobby on behalf of China for five years after retirement from public service. But I think a lot of public servants recognize that if they don't do anything, which the Chinese government wouldn't like that this will benefit them after they leave government service. And, you know, we see a lot of examples of, of this, uh, not just from people in the liberal party, but also from certain elements of the conservative party. So China knows how to, and I guess, play upon our Canadian naivete and perhaps greed to um, ensure that things go their way. But, um, you know, I think most Canadians, don't think that this is the right thing that Canadian civil servants and politicians should retire on their pensions and not, uh, you know, see an opportunity to get serious. I think what my friend in Britain, Charlie Parton refers to as uh, life changing amounts of money out of the Chinese regime and retirement. Charles Burton, thanks so much for joining us and uh, sharing your views. Appreciate it's it. Good to speak and with you. And bottom line, we're all very happy that the two Michaels are back, right? That's for sure. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody.